Hi, and welcome again to another lesson in The Journey. We are looking into Satan's dream. What is Satan wanting to do on this earth? What is his strategy? We are guessing that if we can figure out what Satan's strategy is, what his dream is, then we are going to be able to overcome it passionately, pursuing God and then living an authentic life, a life where God gets the greatest glory and where we get the greatest joy. In our first message, we talked about two passages that seem to be addressing the person or being of Satan and his fall. The first was found in Ezekiel chapter 28. Through it, we found that Satan was first off created and that he was perfect in wisdom and beauty, that there was no other being that compared to him. We also discovered that he was in the government of God and that he was somehow involved in worship, somehow receiving it and then passing it on to God. Then we concluded that Satan's wisdom and beauty got the better part of him. And he must have thought to himself, why should I have to pass all of this on to God? Why not keep some of this for myself? Pride got the better part of him and he was judged as a result. To help you see a more biblical example of what has happened to Satan, I want to give you another example of this from the Bible. Let's turn quickly to Acts chapter 12. In the context of the passage, it is 44 AD. Herod is the king of Judea, appointed by Rome. His area was the wheat belt of the area, and they provided grain for many of the cities in that area. Tyre and Sidon were two of those cities that were dependent upon his grain. Yet somehow they had offended King Herod. So in trying to get back on his good side, they try to flatter him and ask him to come and speak to their people. After his speech, they really pour on their praise by saying, this isn't the voice of a man, this is the voice of God. What was happening here? They were giving him praise. And what should any person do? Much less any person in authority who was given that authority by God. What should they do when they are given praise? Give it all back to God. Where Herod was at this moment in the book of Acts is exactly where Satan was. He was getting praise for his beauty and wisdom and passing it back to God. So what happens? Well, let's look at it in the book of Acts in verse 21 of that chapter. On an appointed day, Herod, having put on his royal apparel, took his seat on the rostrum or throne and began delivering an address to them. The people kept crying out, the voice of a God and not of a man. And immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give God the glory and he was eaten by worms and died. The text infers very clearly that the glory should have been given to God. God wanted Herod to pass the glory on to him just as we should do as well. Why? God puts men in authority. So we should honor God for that. And as the scriptures say, in Him, we live and move and have our being. Here is an example of a man who was receiving praise and who should have passed that glory on to God. This was Satan's problem. In his sanctuary, he was receiving praise like Herod, and he should have passed it on to God. But he did not. He was judged. Now, we don't know what was going through Herod's mind. We can assume he was power hungry and received the praise enthusiastically. This was the same Herod whom the three wise men talked to as they were searching for Jesus at his birth and the same Herod who wanted to kill this newborn king. He didn't want anyone else to take over his power. Although we can't see what was exactly going on in Herod's mind, we can catch a glimpse of what was going through Satan's mind by looking at the other passage we spoke of, the passage in Isaiah. It is in the 14th chapter of Isaiah and to some a debatable passage as to whether it really references Satan. I want to address this quickly why it is debatable. In the context, Isaiah is talking to the king of Babylon at that time, Sennacherib. As he is talking about him, he begins to make Satan-type references, but he makes no new reference to a higher king as Ezekiel did. 
Therefore, many believe that what is being said to him is in symbolic terminology, but it directly applies to King Sennacherib alone. So why would anyone else think it refers to Satan? Many believe it references Satan by what is said about the king and the choice of words Isaiah used, which, if literal, could never apply to a man. Therefore, many believe it has a double reference, referring both to Sennacherib and to Satan. Again, remember, God spoke to Satan through the snake, through Peter, and through the king of Tyre, so the double reference is very acceptable. Let's see what is said and see how it gives us insight into the fall of Satan. It begins in verse 12, saying these words. How you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn. You have been cut down to the earth. You have weakened the nations. Right off the bat, we find this star of the morning falling from heaven. How can a man fall from heaven? If those words are literal, he cannot. It must refer to some angelic being. If it is symbolic language, then the king is simply being humbled, thinking he was God. But we are believing this to be literal. Somehow Satan's judgment seems to have put him on the earth. It seems he was somehow in heaven, sentenced to the earth. Was he stripped of his power when he was confined to the earth? No, it doesn't seem like that. Why? Well, remember, the Bible says he is the prince of this world, the god of this age, the rulers of the kingdom of the air. It sounds like he still has power, but it is no longer in heaven. Now, the next two verses have what are commonly called the five I wills. These I wills refer to Satan's attempt to overthrow God in his power. Verse 13 contains the first three. But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God, and I will sit on the mount of assembly in the recesses of the north. Let's take them one at a time. The first I will is I will ascend to heaven. Now, immediately there seems to be a contradiction between verses 12 and 13. Verse 12 says, you have fallen from heaven. But verse 13 says, I will ascend into heaven. Well, was he in heaven or wasn't he when he was judged? What doesn't help us understand this passage is the word but, which starts off the verse. With that word, it reads this way. You are cast down to the earth, but you said, I will ascend into heaven. We are reading from the New American Standard Bible, which in many people's eyes seems to be one of the most accurate, but they miss it on this one. In the original Hebrew, the word you is written twice, a cultural way of emphasizing a point. It should read, you, you said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. Many times the translator puts in a conjunction to make it read easier. Using the word but doesn't seem, though, to be the most accurate. I like the King James translation where they use the word for. You were judged for you said in your heart. In other words, this is why you were judged. You were judged because you said, I will ascend into heaven. It sounds like Satan is saying this on the earth. But we saw he fell from heaven. What could this mean? How could Satan say, I will ascend into heaven when he was already there? Well, there could be at least two options as to what that means. One or both could apply. First, Satan may have started out on the earth while having full access to God in the heaven. In his existence on earth, he was in the perfect state of beauty and wisdom, and his role in the government of God was to be the prince on the earth, taking in praise of those beings there on the earth and then freely going to God in heaven possibly into the very throne room of heaven as a cherub and passing praises on to him. In this first option, what is being stated in the first I will is that he wanted a permanent place in heaven. It would also mean that the rebellion of sin first took place on this earth. If this is true, the earth becomes a very key location in the microscope of eternity. Both rebellion, sin, fall, Judgment, redemption, and salvation all take place on this orbiting mass we call earth. No wonder 
The angels are watching intently, as Ephesians chapter 3 tells us. But the second option could be seen by the fact that Satan was in heaven, but not at the highest level. There are various levels of heaven. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2, Paul speaks about being caught up into the third heaven. More evidence of this comes from the fact that the Old Testament tabernacle was to be a shadow of the heavenly things. We learn this in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 5. And that tabernacle, too, contained different levels, if we may use those words, where only certain people could go and one place, the holiest of holies, which was a place where only priests could go and then only once a year. If this is the case, then Satan may have been at one of the lower levels of heaven, receiving the worship and then passing them on to God at a higher level and possibly only at certain times. So, he either started out on earth with free access to God and was put on the earth permanently until God called for him, or he was in a lower level of heaven and was cast down to the earth until God called him into his presence. In either option, he was not satisfied with where he was. He wanted to go higher somehow into his celestial position. Well, the second I will says, I will raise my throne above the stars of God. Stars are referred to many times in the scriptures. Those references fall into two groups. The first is the reference to the stars we see in the sky. The second group clearly refer to the messengers of God. In Revelation 1, 16 and verse also 20, God speaks as holding the seven stars in his hand. And these are declared to be his messengers to the churches. Job 38, verse 6 and 7 referred to the morning stars singing. Daniel chapter 12, verse 3 talks about turning many to righteousness as the stars. So what is this saying? It is saying this. Somehow, as Satan would take the praise to God of the angels on the earth, or whoever was on the earth, he was passing other angels on the way, on his way to the inner circle of God, thinking, you know what? I should be getting their praise too. He was not satisfied with the praise he was getting. The third I will says, I will sit on the mount of the assembly in the recesses of the north. The phrase mount of assembly is only found here in the Old Testament, but in its context it makes great sense. Why? Because Babylonian myth had it that the gods would assemble on a mountain. Therefore, the power of the government would be there. And because it is in the recesses of the north, the word north refers to the Almighty's government. We can glean this from Psalm 75, verses 6 and 7, which says, For not from the east, nor from the west, nor from the desert, which easily could be translated into south, comes exaltation. But God is the judge. The implication, God is in the north. He's not in the east, the west, or the south. God is north. And just as we get our bearings from true north, so we should be getting our bearings from God. So what Satan is saying is, I will sit in the government of God above all others. The fourth I will says these words. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. So by now you are surely asking, okay, what do clouds refer to? Hmm, great question. In the scriptures, God many times manifests his glory in the great arm of protection in a cloud. Do you remember how God protected his people on the Egyptian side of the Red Sea? It was by a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day. When the Old Testament tabernacle was completed, God appeared in a cloud. In Matthew 26, verse 64, Jesus, in speaking to the high priest just prior to being crucified, told him that he would see Jesus coming on the clouds of heaven. These are the symbols of God, his glory, of the throne of heaven itself. Above these, Satan wanted to rise. He was saying, I want to be above the glory of God. In the fifth I will, Satan says, I will make myself like the Most High. Now, why did Satan choose to use that name? Why didn't he say, 
I will make myself like the Creator. I will make myself like the Almighty God, like the Great I Am. The answer is found in looking at where this name was first used. We find it in the book of Genesis, when Abraham meets Melchizedek, the priest of the Most High God. In Genesis chapter 14, verses 18 and 19, we read these words. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was a priest of God Most High. He blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hands. Note the descriptive words of what follows Most High. Two key elements, possessor of heaven and earth, and who delivers your enemies into your hand. Why did Satan use that name? He wanted to be the possessor of heaven and earth and be able to defeat his enemies. He didn't want to share the throne with God. He wanted to replace the Most High. Why? He thought too much of himself. Pride had entered in. He saw himself more superior to any of the other angels and was greedy for more glory and praise. So let's review. What have these two passages taught us so far in the hopes of understanding more about Satan's dream? Pulling these two together, we learn that the morning star, Satan, was created. At the moment of his conception, he was astoundingly beautiful and perfectly wise, the seal of perfection. He was involved in the government of God by being the prince of the earth, somehow taking praise from the earth and passing it on to God in his very presence. So great was his power, so awesome his beauty, so magnificent his wisdom that he wanted to keep some of the glory. He looked around and became dissatisfied when he saw others not worshiping him. Therefore, he wanted to rise above them. As he saw the government of God, he wanted that power as well. As he saw what the Most High had, he wanted to possess it all. In short, Satan was basically saying, mine is the kingdom, mine is the power, mine is the glory. Through pride, greed, and arrogance, he rebelled and sinned. This is the original sin found in creation. For you see, in all eternity past, there had only been one will in creation. Now, for the very first time, there were two wills. God did not judge him permanently by annihilating him forever. God simply confined him to the earth in a more permanent state. This rebellion did not take God by surprise. The one who knows all knew it would happen, and he had plans for it. We'll find out about these plans much later in the journey. But for now, Satan's dream was to become like the Most High. He wanted the glory for himself. He thought he was worthy of it. This is the seed from which all sin springs from. This is the foundation of all evil. This is the beginning of a rebellion against God. This, in essence, is where Satan's dream comes from. Thank you for being with us in Lesson 2 of Satan's Dream.